Welcome to Directly Correct, a P Flames podcast with Colin Scott. Today's guest, Jackson Roach. Thanks to our sponsors, Orgnostic. Fast track the insights behind your people data using Orgnostic by connecting all your HR data in one people analytics platform. Quickly uncover the insights you need to measure the success of your people initiatives. Orgnostic is the most innovative people analytics generative AI, data orchestration, and employee listening tool on the market. To learn more, book a demo at orgnostic.com slash directionally correct. And then you put somebody's stapler in Jello, you know. Never did plastic. that. <laughs> yeah, the, the Dwight shirt. Uh, yeah, exactly. The gym pranks. Well, Jackson, man, thanks for, thanks for joining us today. Um, you've been really, I feel like, at least from my perspective, on a writing spree getting getting your stuff out there so well done what 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 uh what's motivated you to kind of get your name out there yeah i i I mean to be honest with you i've I've always really liked writing um i i've followed a lot of writers on substack um including uh yourself and um it really just started out as a a new year's resolution of you know hey, hey it'd be cool to you know i have all these thoughts they they go nowhere or they end up as you know um, lectures that I, I I give to to people without their without their consent. Um, so you know, I actually you know, putting it out there in in a structured kind of format, and and um, I just really wanted to see where it would go, and it's gotten some positive reception. So um, started to have some momentum, and um, to be honest with you, I I just enjoy writing for the sake of it. Um, I feel like it helps me learn things because I I'm I may have some vague idea. Um, that 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 is kind of bouncing around in my head, but I don't have a lot of structure to it, or um, you know, I I, I haven't really, really fully like tested it out or tried to falsify it or or red team the idea. And the writing process kind of helps me with that process and potentially get to a totally different conclusion um, just through that. So I, I I it's just a fun thing to do. Yeah, the great thing is like not many people are doing it. So even publish a few articles you put your name out there far more than you're like in the top five percent automatically exactly yeah i i think a lot of people are are nervous you know and, oh, and it's yeah. un- understandably so like just broadcasting your your you know deepest thoughts about your what you're supposed to be an expert in is really putting yourself on the line but um from i i love the point that you make that like just just by doing that um gets you you know, more, more readership or or more, more influence than, than almost everyone else. Yeah. Well, like why did, why did this kind of thing emerge? Do you think, you know, like there's, there's people out there, they're writing, they're kind of filling a gap. You know, what was like, was that part of your motivation to do that? I I think that's part of it. I, I think in, in our, our field of IO psychology or, or people analytics, um, there, there's a little bit of a, a missing middle in terms of, you know, we, we have folks that are doing great research and, and, and they're scientists and um, a lot of their work is locked behind paywalls and, and doesn't have a lot of good like publicity other than, you know, some, some Adam Grant books here and there um, and some other TED Talks here and there. And then you have practitioners who, you know, a lot of their work is proprietary, so they can't necessarily share like the cool analysis that they did at, at mm-hmm. their company. Um, so there's this there's this gap in the middle where um, there there there's space for like the good ideas are there. It's just a matter of making them available to to a, a broader audience. There's so much content too. Like no one as a practitioner really has time to review articles the way an academic does, right? There's it's just inundated month after month, and like you really need some sort of like aggregation engine to, you know, to distill the information to something usable. For, for, forget all the stuff that's just like not usable at all. And I guess you become that aggregation engine by doing this. Yeah, and just just uh, you know playing that translator role. Um, yeah. Which, which uh, obviously you you guys do here with the the podcast and the Substack newsletter as well. But I, I think there's probably a shortage of translators. Um, so uh, it's it's cool to participate in that, and and hopefully you know m- more people will jump on board and start to connect some of these gaps. Um, you know, what, what's, what's, what, you got any articles you want to pimp? Like you got some uh, things you're really proud of? 
Yeah, you know, I, I just wrote an article about the Lindy effect in people analytics and, and the relationship between uh, worker tenure and turnover. Um, that, that was a fun one where I, I, I talked about how there's, there's this statistical phenomenon called the Lindy effect, which was actually coined in, in New York City, Broadway in the 50s, where these comedians were like speculating about it. it they said, you know, it seems like the lifespan of a comedian is inherently proportional to the amount of exposure they've had to that medium. And it turns out that this effect is actually a statistical phenomenon that you see across fields, uh, you know, everywhere you see this notion of things that have been around for a while are gonna stay around in the future. And, um, you know, I, I had some experience working with the, the variables tenure and, and worker turnover and and there always seemed to be a consistent pattern you know at different organizations or in different departments within an organization um so so you know to be able to draw from some of the research to say like there's actually some theory behind this phenomenon um kind of like we would have theory behind employee attitudes um just a, a, a fun topic yeah i mean well let, let's Let's dig in this a little further. I mean, I think this is one of the reasons why so there's so many people start a podcast and then two episodes in, they quit doing the podcast. I feel like that's the Lindy effect, like the opposite side yep. of it. The things that aren't going to stick around don't stick right. around either. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but let me let me give you a quick introduction, Jackson. I, I, I think I forgot I glossed over that. <laughs> um, so Jackson Roach is the head of people analytics at Wex, uh, self-described armchair economist turned professional IO psychologist, uh, like we mentioned, writes for Substack, um, focuses on people analytics, organizational psychology, and then some of the stuff that's going on with AI and machine learning. And in Jackson, we actually wrote an article together uh, about elephant hunting and using algorithmic decision making in people analytics. What, what was what was kind of the thought process there? Cause that was, that was definitely more your idea than mine it, behind this. And, and I mean, this seems really relevant to a lot of the discussion that's going on right now about decision-making using AI. Do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously we're, we're at this inflection point with AI where, where we're starting to have to wrangle with how do we, use it in high stakes scenarios like personnel selection and how do we do this fairly and um pe people that are focused on ethical and responsible ai in our field are are worried about ai potentially scaling bias right um so so the idea that you can screen thousands of resumes uh, well, can i ask you about that what is bias like i hear this all the time what is it and why is it important for us to care? Yeah, uh, great question. I, I, I would I would look at bias uh, as as th there are kind of two types of measurement error. Um, say if you wanted to uh, measure a group of people's uh, job performance, right? You can have random error and you can have systematic error. Random error is just noise. It's like, hey, our measurement instrument isn't perfect. Um, sometimes just by chance we overestimate or we, we undershoot. Systematic error um, is also known as bias. And, and really what people are talking about in, in, this, um, in this scenario is, is, is systematic error related to a protected demographic, whether that's age or, or sex uh, or ethnicity. Um, so, you know, if, if we are consistently overshooting or undershooting on our measurements um, of, of somebody because of one of those protected classes, then obviously that that is a, a bias that is arising from uh, a machine learning model or an algorithm that um, we, we would want to prevent. This is, this is the portion of the podcast where Cole puts you through a uh, comps review. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, it's just like we use these terms like really kind of cavalierly. It's like, well, what what do we mean? I don't know. I, I apologize, Jackson. Keep no, going. no. It, tell, it, us, it, tell us it, more about algorithmic decision making. Well, I mean, we, we do talk about these sort of things without really discussing the underlying aspects of them, right? Like we, we um, bias is inherent to pretty much everything we do. We just need to account for it as best we can, right? And on the other hand, you want to discriminate. 
You want to discriminate uh, the things you're looking for versus things you're not looking for. Yeah, a- absolutely. And and it's great to define our terms, but but really the, the key insight of, of our article, um, Cole, I think was that you know, there's a possibility of scaling bias through AI. That That's a very real and yes. legitimate concern. Um, but the question is, at any given time, compared to what, right? So our, our, our kind of key insight was that, you know, there's this thing called the unstructured job interview, and it happens to be the social norm for how people are selected everywhere at scale in mass today. And that is very biased by by its nature. Um, because people are biased, right? Um, you know, the 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 best looking, uh, tallest, most confident, and charismatic people get selected for for jobs all the time because of human bias. Um, and and one of the key issues with that is that we don't have any visibility into that because there's no data, right? Um, by by virtue of it being unstructured, nobody's sitting there with a form saying this is how I'm rating Jackson on this interview. Um, it there, there's no data, so we couldn't even look for bias if we were concerned about it. Compared to a- AI and machine learning, is there may be bias in the models, but these problems are tractable because we have the data, we have uh, mechanisms for for evaluating, um, and, and this is a, a really you know kind of burgeoning field uh, within IO right now. Is is how do we audit these models um so yeah it just comes back to the the core question of compared to what what's the counterfactual mm-hmm. this is uh um how to measure anything aspects of like yes your model may not be that great but it's better than what random chance that, that's always the baseline you got to compare everything to yeah, exactly. Or we, we only we only explain twelve percent of the variance. Dang, yeah. isn't, isn't that uh, you know isn't that pretty <laughs> That's better than nothing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's absolutely room for improvement too. Well, Jackson, I know you you actually had a bunch of stuff you wanted to talk to us about today. Anything you wanted to bring up? Well, I I think um you know on the topic of writing in Substack, I I think we we'd be remiss to not talk about how um, we're, we're seeing more and more folks sign up uh, to write Substacks or uh, blogs about about people analytics and IO, um, which I think is really cool. So, I, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on, like, are, are, are we are we seeing the emergence of a, a blogosphere in, in the field of people analytics or IO psychology? Where, you know, where, where does this go or how, how do we get, you know, writers connected to each other, things like that? I think they should all stop writing, you know, like just, <laughs> just quit it is there's not enough for, there's not enough to go around for all of us you got to stop you know? <laughs> <laughs> i mean like, like cole like like what was the community like you you publish something it feels like weekly or bi-weekly anyway like is yeah. there a community around there i don't know i'm not good like i i feel like jackson you're more integrated in like what's going on in like Substack. i just kind of post and let it go out and do its thing and i i, I do a lot of stuff on linkedin but I wouldn't say like I'm a member of a community per se mm. in any way. I don't know. Do you feel a part of a community? I, I guess what I'm asking is like, are we in the, you know, midst of, of the creation of one? Um, and, 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 and part of how I think about this goes back to um, I, I'm like a, I'm like a blog nerd who followed um, a lot of the, the blogs coming out of like the, the mid and, and uh, late two thousands where you had these folks and, and what is now called the rationalist community. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this, but basically a bunch of nerds from uh, kind of Silicon Valley in the San, San Francisco area started creating blobs and, and talking about, you know, weird, like kind of niche things like effective altruism, yeah. um, which is the crazy oh, yeah. idea that like, the hey, our charity. Should, yeah, right. Like that, those good people. Yeah. Yeah, those good people. Um, and so now, yeah, of course, now there's this weird controversy, um, you know, related to that. But but some cool things have come out of that community too, like um, the the whole uh, the, the whole AI alignment field wouldn't even be a thing if it weren't for that community. What does that mean? Yeah. So AI alignment is the term for um, the the risk of. Uh, extinction, human extinction arising from AI. 
So it's it's this field of like existential risk that basically says, how do we control AI and align it with human interests so that we don't get this exponential like super intelligence that one day <laughs> takes over and then all of a sudden like we're all dead. Is it even possible to like stop progress? I mean, like this is what Musk and like other folks have, uh, uh, they, they signed some sort of treaty or something like that, some pact where it's like, I don't know, man, the genie's out of the bottle. Like, I don't know if we're going to do here. Yeah. Yeah. Could we even stop it at this point? Well, what, what, what is Gen AI? Like, what are the best benefits for a uh, people analytics organization? Like, you kind of talked about selection and it could introduce bias there, but there, there's got to be like other areas that it can influence, right? Well, what, what, what do you two see as the biggest impact for Gen AI? I mean, the way I kind of look at it is you're there's there's this. The tricky part of it is this, some of the generative AI stuff is really promising. What makes people feel uncomfortable is if it does one of two things. If it's going to replace a human, uh -huh. you know, the human who's in that role is like, ah, I'm not crazy about this, right? Or if it's going to replace something you enjoy doing, right? Like if it's something you really like, like doing, it's like, well, I don't want to do that. So the kind of the conclusion I've come to is it's hopefully just going to be really good for automating things that no one wants to do, right? That, that to me seems to be the most killer of use cases. Whereas like when you do get into the algorithmic decision-making component, you're on much, you have to watch, walk on much finer eggshells to do this appropriately. But if you're just getting rid of work that no one ever wanted to do in the first place, and it's like, okay, now it's automated, I think we can all collectively clap about that. Sheer, sheer time savings play. Yeah. And that's the productivity. Everybody said, yeah. you know, generative AI is going to bring about productivity improvements. Well, that's it. That's the productivity improvements. It, it leads to faster decision making, too, right? Like, if you can automate that, uh, you can make decisions at speed, which just speeds everything up. And I guess you need more AI to handle that, too. At some point, like there was like approaching singularity, no matter what. I mean, are we? I don't feel like it. Sometimes well, I, mean, I feel like it. Today's not one of those days where I'm like, oh yeah, we're just on the verge of AI super intelligence, and like it just doesn't feel like it at this point moment in time. Well, yeah, I think everything's relative too, right? Uh, to to your point, like I, I famously talked about this. I had an old. Uh, mentor boss how you want to talk about it he was conducting psychometric analysis in the 1930s and 40s and he would run correlations by hand you know write it all out calculate it all out and then when he was done you know they had fairly small sample sizes but you know a lot of items whatever he'd have to do it again so it'd take another week or two to calculate this all out just in case he made a mistake <laughs> now you just hit a button on spss or you know your platform of choice is done but to your point that time gets filled it's like a vacuum and however long the meeting lasts that's how long that your work your work's gonna fill your work is the lindy effect of meetings man like that's what it is <laughs> there you go <clears throat> well and, and interestingly you know that didn't put statisticians out of a job right? no like, that, that that's kind of a key insight is that um the demand for statistician work is so great that you know that just frees people that are stats experts to, to work on more questions or better questions and I, I think we'll probably see something similar with generative AI. Um, I think, first of all, like we're, we're super early days. Yes. Um, Andrew Ng, who's a, a professor of AI at Stanford, um, just gave a talk on like, what is the state of AI in 2023? And, and uh, he, he talked about how the vast majority of use cases are, are still around supervised learning, which is just like labeling things, you know, this employs high flight risk or low flight risk. Um, Generative AI may, may start to kind of encroach on that market share um, of, of AI use cases, but we, we still really don't know. And we're still very far away from anything resembling super intelligence. I, I think the, the, the benefit of a computer, Gen AI, is that it has perfect memory. You know, you can input just a ton of things into it and um, say like um, um, strategic planning for managers. All of a sudden, a manager can know what every other department's doing, and AI can cascade goals down to the teammates, and you could have essentially a line strategy, and then humans come in and mess it up with you know their you know foibles, their bias, this sort of thing. Bias, yeah. 
Uh, but I mean, I think that's that, that's a time savings. Like what used to take you several weeks and meeting after meeting after meeting. Oh, well, just like we have all the information in the system. It'll spit out a plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but once again, it could lead you down the wrong path, not the path you want to take. Well, I have an analogy I want to try out with you guys. Uh, I said this to somebody earlier today about what I think is going on with AI. And it's kind of related to like what's going on in people analytics. There's people analytics where we do like research, right? Mm. And so we go deep on one topic and maybe you build a PowerPoint at the end of it and you present it out and hopefully they take action on it. But sometimes if something is like really substantive and we want to make sure it's repeated over and over again, we pivot from doing research into building products, right? Like, like, like cool or putting building. models into production rather yeah. than just being a one-time model that we, we see here. The thing I see with AI is if you replace the word research with novelty, I see a lot of what it's going on is like just making more novelty. So at first it started out with just, you know, text and then it became text and images and now it's text and images and voices, but it's just adding more novelty to it. I'm not seeing a whole lot of what I would call models in production like things that are going out there that are actually helping people all the time that aren't just novelty seeking. I don't know, do you guys agree with that? I, I would agree with you with the, the stipulation that I want to see what's going to happen when all of these tools are instantiated in the office products and, and Google's equivalent. Um, Cause it, it seems like we're, we're still in the early days of that. Yeah, like, why isn't out. that already out there? Like they uh, announced that stuff question. like a year ago, it feels like, and it's yeah. like, why is it not everywhere? And to me that tells us like, okay, novelty is at a premium, but real use cases are much harder than they're letting on, which makes me believe that like, we're way far away from the singularity. I, I don't think that, I, I, that yes, we, we don't see a whole lot of forward facing tools, right? We, we don't have a whole lot to our fingertips, but I think that they're out there. Like, there's a lot of AI being conducted behind the scenes, even simplistic AI, uh, you know, if then sort of statements, et cetera. Uh, but that is like a form of AI. Um, I just don't think that we have the the sight lines into it. But to your point, I think that it will be made apparent in the next two years. Question for you guys. Do you think we have the use cases? Um, because like it, it seems like to me, you, you, you can you can treat machine learning as a hammer and try to go find the nails, and that doesn't work really well. Mm -hmm. But the, the biggest AI powered companies have had have said, kind of, we have a very specific issue. Like, I need to find a ride share with Uber, or how do I find a potential date with Tinder? Like, do we need to step up to the plate in people analytics and say, here are the specific valuable use cases for AI, and and work, work it at that way? I'll be your matchmaker, Jackson. I mean, if that's what you're looking for, man, we can make this happen. I have an algorithm for that. I don't need your bias, Cole. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, Jake's got a guitar, man. He, he's a picker. He, he's, he's good. He's talented. Also true. I also have a girlfriend, so. Oh, yeah. Womp, womp. Well, I mean, like, we, we've had, uh, say, like, people on, like, scorecards for a long time. Like, weighted sort of field, this sort of thing, which leads to the best overall decision. That in a form is AI. You have to input your own numbers, this sort of thing. Uh, it's just not formalized and automated. Not yeah. productized. I don't know, man. Well, like, I mean, I feel like this conversation could go anywhere, Jackson, but I mean, you, you are you an economist, economist by training? Like, did you study that before now? Because I, I think about like, like what's going on in the macroeconomic environment, interest rates, like, all this kind of stuff. Like, what do you see happening in the broader world? Yeah, so I, I got my bachelor's degree in economics. Um, so I, I, I kind of pivoted um, from from economics to IO and, and grad school. Um, so so not not a, not not a, an economist by training necessarily, but I I know enough to be dangerous. Um, I, I I really find the economics kind of conceptual toolkit to be extremely valuable. Um, concepts so? well we, we've referenced some of these already in our conversation um counterfactual thinking saying like uh, compared yeah. to what um the notion of a uh, opportunity cost is closely related to that obviously and mm -hmm. and then you have things like um transaction costs which are a super relevant concept cole you've talked about how 
the role of people analytics is is to lower costs. You know, we're not a revenue center. We have to justify our existence. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot Don't of- Don't be quoting me to me. I'm going to forget <laughs> what I said. <laughs> I think you said that um, in, my, in my words. But um, the, the idea that there are kind of these like, costs that are real economic factors, but that maybe don't show up on the balance sheet. Um, things like it takes a lot of time to search and find people or to coordinate or to enforce contracts. A lot of these concepts are really relevant to people analytics. Um, and just just help, at, you know, at, at, if you're a leader trying to figure out what's important in, in your, your company and people analytics, I think a little bit of economic literacy goes a, a long way. Um, cold to your question, like what's going on in the macroeconomic environment. Um, I, I don't think there's like a, one single way of just saying like, oh, because we're in a, you know, hiking rates or high, high interest rate environment, like here's what we should do in people analytics. But I do think if you look at the macro environment and then you look at your organization or the organization you're consulting with and you say, what, like, what is their situation? in relation to the macroeconomic environment, it can be super powerful in terms of helping you understand the sort of insights that are gonna be valuable to that organization. Um, you know, th there are there are boom companies and bust cycles and there are, there are bust companies and boom cycles, but w once you understand the situation, then you start to understand, okay, you know, some, some analytics around finding talent would be really helpful to this company because we're trying to grow as fast as we can and talent acquisition is the limiting factor, right? Or maybe like we need to get more efficient because credit is getting more expensive. So let's look at spans and layers or revenue per FTE and those sort of insights might be more valuable in that context. Will there be peace in the Middle East? I mean, if we're talking oh, like global. <laughs> I was waiting into it, man. Final, I, I was waiting for you to ask that question, Scott. <laughs> Yeah, anyway. <laughs> Y'all want to move on? Y'all want to do some Confusion Matrix? The Confusion Matrix. Yeah, let's do some Confusion Matrix for you. All right, all right. Uh, let's do some Waffle House. We haven't done Waffle House in a long time. Yeah, man. Jake, oh, you've been doing... Hey, by the way, so I was in Denver earlier this week, and I saw a guy wearing a Waffle House hoodie, and I was like, oh, I wonder if he listens to the podcast. Like that was like legitimately my wow. first reaction, and then I realized, oh wait, we're not the center of the universe. <laughs> that people wearing Waffle House hoodies has nothing to do with us. Well, I mean, like Jake, did you know that Cole managed a Waffle House? Maybe. No kidding. I, I was a waiter there for like three months. <laughs> I did not manage. I feel like wearing a Waffle House shirt is just asking for a fight on the street. Like it's a strong statement, right? I wanted to know where he bought it from. <laughs> can you buy a waffle house shirt just go to waffle house and be like give me a shirt no it was a hood like it was like a hoodie like i'd never it wasn't like a uniform that someone would wear at waffle house it was like a fashion i like something that you you bought at urban outfitters or something i don't know wow okay no that's definitely a choice if you go to yeah. urban outfitters anyway sorry i interrupted you scott what's going on with the waffle house <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a write-in. We actually have an official write-in from someone else that was interested in this question. So, I mean, and, and by the way, if anyone has any other write-in suggestions, uh, text Cole because it's yeah, questionable whether I will ever respond. Yeah, don't don't text me. We don't want them. <laughs> We're just gonna come up with our own. Definitely text Cole. Definitely text Cole. <laughs> okay, Jake, would you rather survive a tornado or a tsunami? And I was told it was the whole experience from like seeing it come in mm -hmm. to the aftermath. Oh, well, you know, I, I'd probably have to pick tornado. I'm from Kansas City, so I've yes. um, had, you know, a few close calls with tornadoes before. And, you know, it's it's really not as scary as as other people think. Um, oh, you know, you're taunting the tornadoes. We're talking we're talking relative here. Right. Um, but, you know, just get in the basement, take shelter. It'll roll over you. Um, may destroy your house or something. But I, if you get low, then you should be OK. <laughs> At least, at least tornado like it, it feels like there's like warning right like you hear the sirens go off like in louisiana is like every week there's sirens going off right and you just go outside and stare at yeah. the sky I, don't really actually do anything most of the time you know like i i, I, I i'm talking broad strokes here it it, it it can be scary when 
there's low visibility and sometimes like with the joplin tornado disaster like mm -hmm. the, the weather people there didn't even catch it until it was there was this f5 you know mile wide tornado like going over people's houses so um can can, can be pretty pretty terrible that way yeah, i mean tornadoes actually have much stronger wind than a hurricane though so like my answer would be like is if as long as i'm above sea level like a, a hurricane if you're below sea level <laughs> you're in a bad bad way but if you're above sea level i think hurricane every time over direct hit by a tornado i mean that's that's pretty bad you know i don't know oh well tsunami was the other end of that spectrum but oh, yeah. i thought it was hurricane did i say hurricane well okay option three then not a good listener What's your favorite natural disaster? Great question. <laughs> I'm poor, partial to forest fires, right? You know, you why go. not? Controlled burn. <laughs> Controlled burn. Tsunami's pretty bad. Yeah, tsunami's like wild because like the ocean will like go out and people, that's where a lot of people like die. It's like, why is the ocean 300 yards out further than it normally is without knowing that here comes a wave a mile long yeah. it's coming right at them. When now, in you terms consider... of like what's cooler to watch, like if you could get yeah. to like a high vantage point that you feel safe, a tsunami would be phenomenal to watch. That is like, good watching. Yeah. Weather channel stuff, like people from like the eighth floor of their hotel. Yeah, just, I can't imagine what it's like to see a hundred foot wave. Right. Um, tornadoes are even cool. real. Like I, I feel like this is like <laughs> bass fitching where people are like, oh yeah, I caught 20 pounds. Yeah, it's like, no, you didn't. Like it was, it was like it was thirty feet tops. It's like oh, but it was a hundred feet. <laughs> it's also the length of it too. It's not just like the height. You know, yeah. it's it's the it just keeps coming and it keeps. I feel coming. like we're getting into a different discussion here, but let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, text call. I think that's the that's the point of everything. Here. <laughs> Oh, this is <laughs> wow. We're doing great. Let's, let's, let's move on. I think this yeah. is, this is, we'll call this failed. All right. You want to, you want to do some nerdery? The nerdery. Let's do it. Let's do it. I think you should kick off because I think it sets up uh, other ones nicely. All right. I will do that. So the first article we have today is from friend of the podcast, previous guest rob cross and then some of his co-collaborators like karen dillon and martin reeves about what's fueling burnout in your organization this is a new hbr article that came out uh, not too long ago and I, th I think they go through some of like the usual suspects and especially some of the stuff that rob that's included in rob and karen's new book um i'm sorry the name's escaping me but we we've talked about it before on the My podcast Christmas. yeah but one of the things that I thought was interesting that they put in here is burnout can also be fueled by things like collaborative overload and by like having to go up like up and down unnecessary layers in an organization. And one of the things that they mentioned is like a lot of the work that's going on with spans and layers right now in organizations Although it, I think a lot of it is just because organizations are look, looking to cut costs, what it can do is it can decrease collaborative overload and increase your autonomy to make decisions because you can get to, to decision makers without going through four or five layers of people much more quickly. And that can decrease the burnout of people in organizations. I, I'd never thought about that before. And I thought that was very, very clever. Um, I don't know. Did you have any reactions to this, Scott or, or Jackson? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, like you, you refer to the, like structural complexity of organizations. Mm -hmm. Like, just think about how many teams an average person's on. Like, I don't know. I'm probably on six, eight teams right now. And, like, you have these yeah. sort of like different relationships you need to manage, and like different priorities, and like different information coming at you. Um, so, I mean, it all adds to your overall sense of stress. Uh, not only just uh, uh, that, but, you know, managing different sort of personalities, this sort of thing. But to your point also, like if you need to get to the uh, your skip level, skip level, I mean, in certain hierarchical organizations, that can be a real pain. Yeah. It's like how many people do you have to convince to make one simple decision? Right. And I imagine the lower that number is, 
the more you know the higher oh, yeah. your satisfaction is. I, I think this matters even more for star employees or or high potentials. Um, however you want to define that, you know, I, that, that would be my hypothesis is that the, the flatter the organization, um, and the, and the less layers, the, yeah. the more hypos will thrive because they, they have less potential collaborative overload from having to go through all these barriers. But I do wonder for, for your kind of average performer who gets less one-on-one -on -one attention from their manager, like, could that actually be a detriment? I mean, absolutely. And you know, to your point, a flat organization is going to be easier to influence just because, you know, you can get to people more easily. Um, I, I think that one of the interesting points they brought up here is organizations have ways to introduce complexity into the structure, which what we recently reviewed an article essentially said, you know, complex organizations, they protect themselves from threats by introducing complexity, mm -hmm. but there's no real way to remove it. <laughs> Once it's there, it's there. That's actually, it's kind of related to, I was thinking about this after I read the article. Like imagine, like think about like, there's a really big company. Let's say you have 100,000 employees. What do you think from like, if like if you're really trying to reduce complexity, what's like the minimum number of layers you could have if you had 100,000 employees, right? I mean, like, the CEO can't have it can't a be thousand one direct reports, yeah. you know? And, and so at a certain point, is the if you get to a certain size, there's going to be complexity baked in, baked in, even if you don't have a matrixed organization or anything like that. But like, I mean, I'm sure there's like a math problem of like, what they say the ideal number of direct reports is like seven for every person. So if you did seven times seven times seven all the way down, like how many times would you have to multiply seven to get to a, a hundred thousand people? But I don't know. Like what, what, what do you think? I mean, do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah. I mean, like you, you'd have to turn to like a net network based structure, like uh, the way Wikipedia is organized or uh, how is Wikipedia organized? I, I mean, don't it's even just, know. It's just a collection of people doing their own things, but loosely connected to one another. Therefore you don't really have a hierarchy. It's not really, it is an yeah. organization, but it's not a hierarchy. But I mean, that introduces its own issues in itself, right? Coordination tax. Is that sort of like the holacracy thing from a few years ago? Or is this, are we just no talking idea. about a fundamentally different structure where you're just a completely decentralized organization? Totally de decentralized. Like, uh, you'll, you'll talk about the military, talk about like uh, terrorist organizations like this. They, they do that so that they can be like amoeba like and, mm -hmm. you know, conform to their environment and this sort of thing. But once again, you can't have an, a large Fortune 500 organization operating like that, but that is a way to get to it. Yeah. I, I wonder if another way to get to it is just parent companies, right? Like like often you'll have um, large companies where like the CEO will report to the CEO, right? If it's like the, like the CEO of Blizzard mm. reports to the CEO of Microsoft, and then you basically like get a free layer <laughs> in terms of like the, the coordination. Um, so I wonder if that like in, in... Jackson, there's no such thing as a free lunch. An economist should know. Oh, that's, that's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> one, one thing that like really resonated with me in this article is like they talk about people that write emails that are way too fucking long. Oh, and God, it's like... Yeah. Like the tenth paragraph finally has the information that you're looking for, <laughs> and like even then, it's like kind of clouded. Well, like, and have you guys seen this stuff? Like, and I don't know why some people think this is like a good thing, but you get like the AIs that help you with writing emails, and yes. then the AIs that help you with reading emails. And it's like, who thought it was a good idea to get an AI to take your short email and make it longer so it has more flowery language. <laughs> and then you need another AI to decompose the flowery language to tell you what the email actually said to make it shorter. It's like, why don't we just write short emails? How about that? I'm a three sentence max guy. Like if it's <laughs> four, if it's a stretch, four if I need it, but three sentences, preferably two. I've always found it funny how like, if you have a lot of power distance from somebody, like they will probably just respond to you with like the most brief kind of like, Oh don't, yes. don't, don't give a shit sort of response, you know, like they, they might not even have a signature. Just like, please fix this. Right. Is the classic one. The, um, the biggest power move I saw was wrote, wrote the email in the subject line. <laughs> no <yeah>. content. <laughs> just like, Hey, do this. This is great. Well, 
what do, what do you have for us next, Scott? All right. Uh, so Microsoft finds that in-person in -person settings should be reserved for moments that matter. So uh, their data essentially says that people still find in-person meeting valuable. But of course, people like the flexibility of working from home, this sort of thing. So Microsoft has provided guidance to managers uh, suggesting uh, to empower employees, leaders, managers, et cetera, to find time to meet in moments that matter, namely uh, prioritize onboarding experiences, team building, and launching new products, uh, which seems like a balanced approach to approach this sort of thing. And uh, wow, it's like someone thought of this two years ago when we published an article about it. <laughs> No kidding, right? <laughs> uh, I read your article. Yeah. Possibly. Well, I think it's a Scott, great. I'm curious. Uh, just, I want to pick on this for just a second. It, if you're, if you have an existing team, so again, no new people that are onboarding. Yeah. And they are highly functional already, so they don't need team building, and they're not launching a new product. They have existing products. Should they ever meet? Well, I mean, in person, I guess I should say. Uh, interpersonal relationships are dynamic, though. I mean, like to say that we never need to meet ever seems <sighs> short sighted. Seems I, I harsh. guess. Yeah. Seems like, in, it, it doesn't so sound it doesn't sound ideal by any stretch. I'm glad you said that because this is the part I feel like that's missing from some of this conversation, which you and I have talked about a lot, but I yeah. don't see in a lot of these articles, which is just hey why don't we meet sometimes just because human beings need to meet sometimes right and i, I don't think that's a controversial statement no but it seems to be completely devoid of this discussion it's like because human beings need to see other human beings sometimes it, it feels like people it's, it feels like political alliances people have rallied on two sides either they're we're always in the office or like Screw you! I'm working from home. I do fine yeah. here. And like, just that, each of them cowered into their own little like barriers. Yeah, not everybody. Not everything's a labor issue, you know. Yeah, it's like there's other things in life. That's what has really bothered me about the remote work versus return to office conversation. Um, is is that it? It's just kind of lacked a lot of nuance, and that's what I really liked about this Microsoft article and and what this team was yeah. able to do is introduce that that you know the the it depends kind of question right um you know my my economist brain would say like there's probably pros and cons of of working in person versus working remotely and um it, it we should have a conversation about like what are you trying to accomplish as an organization as a team and what's most important to you and and then if if we can better understand like the the pluses and minuses then you know, that kind of gets you a roadmap to understand what your strategy should, should be. I, I don't know if this analogy will totally work, but you don't go to the grocery store every day or you only go when you need something. And like the sort of same thing, people come into the office when they need something. And that could be like personal contact or to improve onboarding or to organize around um, developing an idea to launch it and get some traction. Yeah. I think I lose touch sometimes because of this podcast. Cause we've talked about some of these topics so many times Yeah, and then I'll go meet with people in the real world and they're just now having these conversations for the first time. And it's like, Oh my God, it feels like time travel. It's like, maybe I am. I'm living in the future. You know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you are from the future, man. And you don't see singularity. So that's probably a good don't thing. See him. Right? Sorry. For the return to office hardliners out there, the benefits of in-person collaboration have to be better than the ability to source talent anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. right? So, I think that's a hard that's a hard barrier to like jump over or a hard bar to clear in terms of just the benefits of access to talent. Um, not to mention saving on office space. So, what, like, what I would like to see is more more companies realizing that, and then setting aside some of that budget that they're not spending on office to get people to the grocery store, Scott, like for what they need yeah. when they need it. Also, these blanket policies just feel like the antithesis of science or curiosity or research or seeking to understand your workforce in a better, more meaningful way. It feels like it's 
I don't want to say giving up, but it's essentially it's it's the you know laying the gauntlet down in a way that doesn't feel like it's beneficial to employees overall, or or couldn't be in the future. Yeah. Well, or like just to kind of build on that, Scott. It's like whether or not it's beneficial to like the productivity of employees seems to be not even part of the debate. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, that's seems silly, right? The, the whole point of this is like to have productive employees. And, but now it's just about what I want or you want and who wins. And I was like, this, this seems silly. You know what I want? What? Next article. Let's do One it. One more article. <laughs> One article. Let's do it. Okay. So this is uh, a short little article by Paul Spector. And he essentially opines for a museum of industrial organizational psychology sort of items obviously a lot of our stuff is cerebral we don't have a physical objects in a lot of ways but uh he uh you know mocks up some ideas on what may be included in uh this hypothetical uh museum so he uh, introduces a 1929 telephone to celebrate the hawthorne studies uh world war ii air world war ii era airplane that's hard to say uh, talk about uh, benefiting human operators, World War One and World War II soldiers, uh, traditional assembly line. Uh, this is an interesting point. Uh, the field of IO was initially called industrial psychology because most of the work was done in factories. Uh, and he talks about some uh, <laughs> well-being, a beating heart, this sort of thing. It starts getting like really abstract here. But kind of a fun little exercise to, you know, re rejoice in our past uh, accomplishments. Yeah, like what, what should be in your metaphorical or literal museum of history of this field? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Is there anything anything interesting you would include, Scott, that maybe he didn't include here? Uh, let's see. Some of the biggest things uh, in the field of IO. I would say Army Alpha and Army Beta cognitive yeah. test. Like it's not necessarily an object, but it is definitely massive sort of implications there um perhaps bars scales behaviorally anchored rating yeah. scales um taylor russell tables if you want to get really fucking nerdy <laughs> it looks like jackson like that one absolutely yeah uh, or, or, may, or maybe there's utility analysis and it's just like in a graveyard yeah apparently that is just off limits at this point we don't need um, that nobody uses that was it sdy wasn't that a thing in utility analysis okay. yeah at, at S, sdxy shout out to fred oswald yeah. who ha had a new article out about that how, how, how it should be done oh yeah another blogosphere new adopter fred, <laughs> fred oswald jumping in the game but uh i don't know i was thinking like what about like frederick taylor's shovel <laughs> from like the introduction of like taylorism you remember this no uh, where they no. were like doing Educate studies me. on people like using shovels and stuff like that i don't know yeah. anyway and the, the timer the, yeah yeah it was like time, time and motion stopwatch. studies yeah. you ever seen these like yeah, time, time and motion, motion studies, studies. Um, gilbreth yeah I think it'd be cool to have an exhibit that, you know, I, maybe this is personality psych proper more than IO, but I always thought it was such a cool story how the big five was created. Um, yeah. This process of like in induction of like, let's identify all the words in the dictionary that could possibly describe somebody. And, you know, just imagine like little, little words strung from the ceiling and a big like clusters and clumps. And you like see them kind of clumping together in like five big, colored spheres could be a cool visual i think we would need a room of demotivational posters i think that would be good you know a little hang in there with a little cat hanging on <laughs> uh <laughs> demotivational post um the the big five if you've ever seen like the sub scales that like filter down it's not just like the big five but then you got the sub scales and even sub sub scales really fascinating sort of uh, visuals. I haven't seen one of those in a long time. And like to your point, the concept of G came about the same way and, you know, split into uh, fluid and crystallized intelligence. And then, you know, you got all these different uh, sub factors associated with it as well. Using yeah. that, you know, psychometric approach to yeah. uh, the, intelligence. The, these are probably really underutilized constructs as oh, well. Yeah. Um, which which re reminds me of a question that I had for, for each of you. Um, 
Cole, you'd written an article about here's what's overrated and underrated in people analytics. And I just wondered if you, you know, you wrote that a couple of years ago, would you have changed your mind on, on any of those in the meantime, or, or maybe any others to add to that? I'll be what honest, are, I don't remember what I wrote. So what are some <laughs> overrated concepts? Cole? <laughs> what did I say? Anything I, I, you disagreed with that I have to defend? <laughs> no, I, I think you were talking about how like um, attrition modeling, strategic workforce planning, that these are overrated. And then like operational workforce planning is underrated. ONA is underrated. Oh, yeah. I, I stand by those for sure. Um, I mean, I, I still every time I talk to a workforce planning person, I, I talk about why you know, I mean, I was even thinking like one, like a person who wrote a prominent book on workforce planning. I talked to them a few months ago and I was like, you left out the chapter on operational workforce planning. They said, well, actually a second version of this book is coming out. We're adding that in. I was like, damn right it is because like <laughs> that's the stuff that actually matters. Um, I, I do feel like ONA, although it does get a lot of love, I think a lot of the concrete, strong use cases are actually what's neglected. It kind of goes back to the AI point from earlier. It's like everybody got caught up in the novelty stuff with ONA, yeah. but it's the strong use cases where I feel like people are just missing the blocking and tackling stuff that I think it could be really helpful for. I mean, I don't know. Is there any, uh, Scott, anything that you think is like overrated or underrated? Uh, I think... Well, it's, it's the implementation of all these sort of things. So we, we talked about earlier uh, around the use case of Gen AI, and there's mm -hmm. not a whole lot of implementation. And yeah. there's a whole lot of analyses that are done, and it's it's organization specific, this sort of stuff. And like the real impact comes from its actual use, because like so much of what we do, like as as a field, kind of just goes by the wayside as far as just like research for research purposes. Uh, with that said, if you're talking about implementation, I really like your idea of individual level attrition modeling is, it sounds like a great idea. Like Jake is about to leave and you're like, oh, great. We, we know that Jake's about to leave. And then like all the weird shit starts happening. It's like, now we got to have a sit down conversation with Jake. We got to get with Jake's manager and like Jake's manager is going to like have a weird conversation with Jake. It's like, Think about how this impacts employees and what it actually means. And are we that good to predict people from, you know, basic, you know, demographic information? Well, and even if we are, to your point, what are we going to do about it and what's the action? Yeah, okay. that's, that's the implementation part right there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, Jackson, anything you think is overrated or underrated? Like anything that you've got your eye on that you want to, you know, put out there publicly? <laughs> you know, one thing I think is probably underrated that I'd add to the list is program evaluation. Um, oh, yeah. Because, you know, we, we do a lot of stuff in HR and not a lot of people are measuring, like, is this even working? Is yeah. this even having its intended effect? And, you know, I, I think it can get a little bit political sometimes because people start oh, yeah. to think, oh, if my program is not found to be effective, will I lose my job? And, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know I, who I, hates I, program evaluation? People who lead programs. Yeah. They hate it. But but they should love it because even if it says if we find that it's not working, we might be able to illuminate some actionable steps to say here's like something we could do to like bridge the gap between like learning and behavior, for example. You yeah. know, it, it constantly amazes me like how much of or how important those like first several months in a graduate program are for IO. And I'm talking about your research methods, your statistics, mm -hmm. because like these things come up comes over back. and over. Yeah. Uh, like program measurement right there. A lot of times if they collect any data at all, it's reaction data, right. no, no real system set up to evaluate further down the line. Or yeah. just setting up right. simple sort of studies. I, you know, it would be funny. This to me would be a funny experiment. You know, like sometimes you watch like a YouTube video or something and they interview somebody on the side of the street and they'd be like, what's the capital of the United States? And like a hundred people can't answer the question because yeah. like, oh, nobody knows anything. It's like, what if you went up to like a, a room full of PhDs and you start asking the question, can you tell me the steps of the scientific method? <laughs> <laughs> And like, I, how many I, people would struggle with that? I would love a uh, 
oh god it would be a great man on the street like it's psyop but it's like yeah explain uh, explain the results of a logistic regression to me and watch yep. them like hmm <laughs> well, yeah please don't ask me we i mean i remember we had keith mcnulty on here and we had to get him to explain what odds ratios were <laughs> like, i still can't do it effectively versus probabilities things that you still google every time you do them <laughs> yeah exactly uh <laughs> all right are we done here i i think i think we're about at time i well jackson it's been fun having you on it, it was fun writing the article with you too uh i think you have um what I, what i really appreciate about you is you have a really critical mind in this space and i love that it's getting out there kind of for the first time and so i'm i'm glad you could come on the podcast but Scott, any final words for, for Jake or Jackson before we wrap this thing up? Jake or Jackson, it's great to see you again. You got a, you got a SoundCloud you want to promote? Yeah, ch check out my new rap album on SoundCloud. <laughs> got a mixtape. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, let, let, like, comment, subscribe. No, guys, I, I really appreciate you having me on. It's super fun. Um, good to see you both again. So. Yeah. yeah, so pound that subscribe button, please. You know? Yeah, ch <laughs> check out People Analytics blog or check out my LinkedIn. Oh, my gosh. Well, you've been listening to Directionally Correct, a People Analytics podcast with Colin Scott and Jackson Roach. Thanks, Jackson. As always, all opinions are owned and do not reflect those of any other organization. You've been listening to Directionally Correct, a People Analytics podcast with Colin Scott. 